when uh, Fresministerium, that is, has it, uh, 10 years ago, asked Noah, France of the Earth, Denmark, to take part in the Fredshøjskole on Bornholm, you're in Folkemøde there, and talk about climate and war threats and solutions. I was tasked with that and I intuitively uh, saw the connection, but I had to look outside my own organization, outside our network in France of the Earth International, and outside the broader climate movement to find uh, resources uh, that I could digest and uh, present uh, in a coherent and interesting way for the audience on that occasion. I actually had to go to uh, uh, sources like uh, UN sources, military sources, and academic sources uh, uh, from the studying of war and, and uh, so forth. But uh, I think it was maybe the first time that this bridge was thought to be built in uh, between those two separated worlds. Uh, I have here... Wait. Sorry. It's a, I have a different picture here, sorry. So, here I have, I have used a, what's called a Möbius band to try and illustrate how I see these uh, uh, two uh, parts of our um, present calamity, how they are interconnected. A Möbius band is a geometric figure in space, you take a piece of paper and you twist it one time and glue it together and you'll know that this, this uh, uh, figure this, uh, has only one surface and only one edge. And so uh, you, you go around and, and uh, we have now the situation where we have capital that controls power in the media, manufactures consent in the, in the population uh, for building up military and in case war which has the, the detrimental consequences for people, environment, and uh, climate. Uh, but uh, after the, the first uh, uh, occasion on Bornholm, uh, we um, continued working together, and a few years later, in 2019, we published a position, worked out a position paper we called Climate Policy is Global Security Policy. And uh, it's over there on the table and uh, I, I have a, uh, picked out a few uh, lines from that. Uh, we said the world is over-armed while the UN Sustainable Development Goals are underfunded. These figures must be reversed. And for wars are themselves destructive to the environment and climate and the global, and milit global military and the military industries environmental and climate impact are grotesque. Climate change and environmental degradation can intensify conflicts and even cause them. It's recognized by many civil society organizations in many branches in the UN system and right up to the Security Council. In, in 2020, uh, we um, initiated the, the, what is the network that's now uh, called Forbid Atomwoben, ICANN in Denmark. We commemorated the Hiroshima Day with an event at Cinematic in Copenhagen. I wanted to, to show a clip of, uh, uh, from that event, but maybe it's time. Pro prohibits it. Yes, I, I yeah, I don't think I, sh I should do that. But we did. You can find it on our website if you want. Uh, I can in Denmark today consists of ten groups, eight peace groups, one guitar ensemble, 
and uh, one environmental organization. All but one are ICANN partners. Since then, our focus has mainly been on nuclear weapons. As the threat they pose, and specifically we have advocated that Denmark should sign and ratify the UN Treaty of, uh, uh, from 2017, the Treaty on the Provision of Nuclear Weapons. On this, we have been uh, benefited greatly by being linked with ICANN. Uh, we celebrated the entry into force of the treaty on the 22nd of January uh, 2021 by projecting a film on Christian Spohr, the Danish Parliament building. Uh, uh, it was accompanied with a very uh, strong music, also Straxa Zustraf of uh, Richard Strauss, while at the same time the Parliament was debating nuclear weapons for the first time in 19 years inside. Uh, presently, we have this uh, campaign called Avoid Nuclear War, Stop the War in Ukraine Now, Prohibit Nuclear Weapons. Well, back to the climate issue. Uh, as early as 19... 88, the, the, uh, the Weatherman's Organization, the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, held a conference on changing atmosphere implications for global security in Toronto. In the concluding statement, it said, Humanity is conducting an unintended, globally pervasive experiment whose ultimate consequences could be second only to a global nuclear war. And these changes represent a major threat to international security now and are already having harmful consequences over many parts of the globe. The best predictions available indicate potentially severe economic and social dislocation for present and future generations which will worsen international tensions and increase risk of conflicts among and within nations. It is imperative to act now. And now, that is uh, 35 years ago. Uh, so the, the weathermen, they knew. I mean, when you see the weathermen on the TV uh, after the news, you wouldn't know that they know, but they did. And they, they, they knew and they connected the dots. Uh, so now I want to, to continue a little bit with uh, my take on, on climate. Uh, I'll not go uh, very deep into this. Uh, uh, I have contributed with, uh, with text for, for this uh, pamphlet that uh, Steen uh, talked about yesterday. You can read more about it there. Um, I've chosen to, to show uh, two sets of figures that are usually called the Great Acceleration. They cover the last 260 years, and all the graphs show a steep rise after World War II. This first one uh, is about, they call it socio-economic trends. I've highlighted one of them, uh, the primary energy use which is what you dig out of the ground, like crude oil or uranium ore. And, and then the next one is called Earth System Trends. And uh, well, these graphs will show some of the adverse effects of the socio-economic trends. And I have highlighted a few of them, like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, ocean acidification, tropical forest loss, and degradation of the biosphere and land. All signals then that impact the overall picture of climate change. So we see that they follow each other nicely. And uh, uh, some have suggested, Paul Crutzen and other uh, climate scientists, uh, uh, have suggested that um, uh, due to this uh, very visible impact on the Earth system, uh, we should uh, name the age, geological age we live in, 
Um, Anthropocene, uh, which means uh, the age of the human beings. Others, a few others have said, no, uh, we should rather uh, label it Capitalocene, because capital is what makes things move on such a grand scale, not people as such. You see, these kids, they are surely humans, they are people, but they have no capital. But they are inundated. They are on the receiving end of climate change. The UN's uh, uh, climate panel, IPCC, uh, issues an assessment report every five, six, seven years. They have made uh, six of them since 1990. Uh, each of these reports have three uh, legs, so to speak, uh, or three parts. The first one is science, like glaciology, meteorology, etc. The second one is uh, about the potential impacts and vulnerabilities and the, the possible adaptation um, uh, for ecosystems, for uh, biodiversity and for societies. And the third one is about mitigation, what can be done. And that's where we find all the scenarios for the future, how, how can uh, we, we deal with the problem. And, and that's where uh, the, the climate panel becomes very political, or it, it is in, in, in the, the nature of it. it must, it's about the future, so it is very political, and it's being politicized also. What is missing, after our, uh, in our opinion, is uh, loss and damage or climate justice. Uh, and that is despite that the foundation for the uh, United Nations work on climate uh, was had actually, in the beginning, a very strong wording uh, uh, regarding climate justice. Namely, the principle uh, that is called uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, which in other words means that those who have the broader shoulders and are most responsible for the mess we are in, they must carry most of the weight. But we've seen that since these words were put on paper in 1992 in the Climate Convention, we've seen uh, uh, an effort to kick the can down the road, especially by the, the United States, European Union, and the, uh, the wealthy uh, countries, Australia, etc. Uh, then I, I'll say a few words about some things I, I think is very important to understand about the climate. And it is that the atmosphere, the climate system, counts the, cumul the cumulative emissions, all the, the emissions. And uh, in fact, uses uh, the atmosphere uses the ocean as a bank. So when there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, it is being absorbed by uh, the ocean as a bank, so to speak. So if we now try to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, the ocean will say, "Thank you, you can have some of the CO2 back again." So it's a very difficult uh, proposal. When we talk about uh, uh, mitigation, what to do, we need a greenhouse gas budget, which is a, uh, the environmental space from a baseline year to a, a targeted year, like from 1990 to 2050. And that is imperative if you want to shape a climate policy on scientific grounds. And that's probably why it's not used very much. Uh, different climate models give difference in budgets, which means how large reductions year on year is required. And uh, it also, the national budget says something about uh, what kind of justice are we uh, aiming at, which means how far back in time should historical emissions be included in our responsibility. And lastly, all emissions must be counted. 
biomass, which is a big issue in Denmark, because we import a lot of biomass to our energy system, and uh, but that is, that is not counted in the Danish reporting to the UN. It's counted in Lithuania or wherever the, the wood is, is uh, grown. And then, of course, international aviation, international shipping, and military missions. At the bottom, we have the famous Keeling curve from the observatory on Hawaii that measure the rise in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And you can see that it has continued steadily since the, uh, it, when it started measuring. And we have the same curve here uh, uh, with the spotlight that uh, on the fact that here to the right, that 50% of all historical CO2 emissions, they have happened since we started talking about climate for real in 1990. 50%. And uh, it also shows how uh, the per capita emissions are different in different countries. And the, they, this is, of course, only average uh, uh, CO2 emissions per capita. There are big differences within the country. Um, here I have a, a, a figure that shows, this is the idea in the carbon budget. Uh, it, it's the area below the curve, the, the colored area that shows the, the, the cumulative emissions in a certain period. And you can see that the, the figure to the left uh, has a much larger budget uh, in compared to the figure to the right. Okay. Then a few words about the military. Uh, modern warfare starts with a large consumption of fossil fuel and it has not been possible to wage wars that way without it. By the end of World War II, a US soldier used four liters of oil per day and it has grown over the years, so in the Iraq war uh, it was 84 liters per day. And when you consider that the U.S. military ha has been in operations or war 128 times uh, in the in the 20th century, including the large wars, uh, World War One and Two, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and then after uh, 2000, uh, 10 to 12 different wars and and operations worldwide. So. That makes for the, uh, that Pentagon is the largest uh, emitter in the world as an institution, larger than many countries. But the Kyoto Protocol from 1997 uh, excluded explicitly the military emissions from, from being counted uh, after a successful lobbying from the United States. But they are happening nevertheless, and uh, the atmosphere doesn't care about uh, our counting of, the, of the, the emissions. Um, yeah. So, so much for that. You can find more about it in, in this pamphlet. Uh, and then there's war. And, and uh, uh, the thing is that, that uh, our, uh, what, I, what we can find about the emissions from the military doesn't include uh, the, the emissions from the destruction that is uh, being uh, performed when, when you go to war. But we know it is happening and we know it is a lot. And uh, it has happened all the time. Here we have Hamburg after the Second World War. Or, and then we have the suffering and, and the dis environmental destruction, these kids, they, are, they have been, been burned with napalm. And uh, the, the, the US uh, Air, Air Forces, they deliberately uh, uh, destroyed crops with Agent Blue and uh, uh, defoliated a forest with Agent Orange. It has left uh, Vietnam with a, an, a, a a tremendous uh, uh, legacy uh, for, for generations to come.
And this is a uh, former airport in Ukraine. Uh, here I have a picture of a, a, an elephant, a very, very diligent, very skilled elephant. Uh, and uh, it's the elephant in the room, and uh, it's the power. And uh, power is, of course, central in all that has to do with armed forces and war, because it's all about a question of acquiring power, of projection of power, and this is why the United States has more than 800 bases abroad in a hidden empire, and this is why nine states have nuclear weapons, and they use them all the time, as Daniel Ellsberg pointed out, as a threat reinforcer. But when we go to, to the, the climate debate, uh, my, my observation is that uh, geopolitics or power is almost absent in the climate debate. Uh, it's too absent. And why is that? I, maybe because the debate has been framed by scientists, politicians, NGOs from the rich countries in the global north. Uh, but the connection between the global power structure and the global mobilization of raw materials, energy, minerals, land, etc. is all too obvious. And it's always at the disposal for the most powerful countries and companies and for the military, as we heard. Yeah. So, I think colonialism and think neocolonialism. And think again about the Great Acceleration. But think also about the manufacturing of consent via the control of the media that blinds us to the machinations of the rich and powerful. And uh, I'll, I'll skip the last slides. Now, uh, how do we proceed from here? Uh, two days ago, I, I took part in a webinar uh, uh, that had the interesting title, Finding Hope in the Climate peace disarmament nexus and this was an interesting way of putting it for me so and that was uh, young people from different global organizations that i never heard about before and uh, I've, I've found out since the last two days that, that this issue has been uh, dealt with by, by many people and many organizations for a long time so when i said that we discovered it 10 years ago. I think it's only because we are very slow here in Denmark. Uh, I, I found a few of these uh, organizations, like here the parliamentarians for uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, and so forth. And there are quite a few. Uh, Young, Fusion, uh, Unfold Zero, etc. And CPRI also has a lot a lot of material concerning this. So, in that spirit, I'll end with the one thing that has... I've been working with climate issues for 25 years, and, and uh, uh, it has not been a very pleasant journey, I must say. Very, not a very... Uh, uh, it has not given many uh, bright moments. But I found my Jesus here. Uh, he's from Australia, and he's called Walter Yine. And you can see he, he is uh, uh, he's here, and he's talking about what, uh, uh, the, what he calls the soil carbon sponge, that, that uh, farmers, everyone who has access to cultivating land, has a chance to take part in, in, in withdrawing, drawing down of uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And uh, it's, it's a long story, but I just want to point to him. He's my Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, I think we can, we, can, we can rearrange the Möbius band from the start and, and uh, have uh, empowerment of people, other media, another kind of concept, disarmament, peace, uh, by peaceful means, of course. And then the help the soil carbon sponge. It cools the planet. It gains it make gains for people, environment, and climate. That's it. Thank you.